hail my latest interview is with Mr. Tom Herbert. Tom and I have known each other for many years, although it's been a long time since I've actually managed to catch up with him. And in that time, he's been involved with some amazing projects. Obviously, two of the original projects you're known for are Polar Bear and The Invisible. On top of that, Tom's had a really extensive career as a session bassist as well. It's great to see someone that's literally straddled three different worlds, the jazz world, the session world. On top of that, he's an original artist. Tom also has a solo bass project, uh, which he's looking to launch again after lockdown. So keep an eye out for that. Please once again, subscribe to my channel, give both myself and Tom a follow on Instagram. And I really hope you enjoy this interview. All right, take care. So my name's Tom Herbert and I'm a bass player and I play upright bass, I play electric bass and uh, used to be in a band called Polar Bear, I have a band called The Invisible and various other things that I'm involved with. I do some session work and I play a lot of jazz. That's a brief overview. And so how did you get into bass in the first place? Can you just talk through your early years? And yeah, the journey to bass. The journey to bass. The journey to bass is, I think it's a very familiar one in that no one else wanted to play the bass. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I, I started on violin when I was like about five. I did that right up until I was about 17 and uh, never really got on with the violin, but I sort of stuck with it. And then a little after that, I started playing piano. I'd always sort of played a bit of piano. And interestingly, my, my mum said that I always sort of gravitated towards the sort of the low end of the piano. And then I started playing guitar when I went to school, to secondary school. And uh, uh, one of my best friends was uh, Dario Rossetti Bonnell. Yeah. And Dario was learning bass as well as guitar. And like you, you probably know, like he's a ridiculous guitar player now and he didn't really want to play the bass like he, he you know he ended up being the bass player in the band because he was the only one that played the bass and he just really really wanted to play the guitar he was quite right <laughs> he should have been playing guitar because he's so good so i was just like well i'll play the bass then and so i did and fell in love with it so i carried on playing guitar and bass and i broke my arm at one point skateboarding and uh couldn't play anything so uh, the only thing I could play was the trumpet because it was the only thing I could hold like with the cast. So I played that for a little while and then my arm got better. They didn't think the arm was going to get better enough that I'd be able to regain full movement. And I still can't quite do it. So I still have sort of trouble sometimes with my, that's my excuse anyway, from my little finger. Yeah, so and then I started playing double bass at college, went to the guild hall and did a jazz course and a classical course there. Started on electric bass. Yeah. And then... Uh, Part of the deal of going to college was that I'd learn double bass because it was a, it was kind of a, it was the first year they were combining the jazz and the classical. They were letting some jazz people into the guild hall um, on the undergrad course. Controversial. <laughs> yeah, but I really wanted to learn the double bass and I wanted to learn classical bass as well because I thought it would give me a good grounding in the instrument, which it did. But I went there like I auditioned, having had like about three lessons from Mark Megiddo. Did he teach you it? Yeah. Probably, yeah. And he was brilliant. Like, and he, he gave me, he, like, he just gave me, crammed like as much like information into like a, a few lessons as possible and I had to play double bass. And I went and did the audition and they laughed at me. <laughs> they actually just, they made me stop. Because, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I had to play like these studies or whatever and it was clear. I turned up with like the, 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 the school double bass, which was like a piece of, crap and um they didn't have a case so we turned up with it wrapped in a duvet <laughs> and then i so i auditioned and um fortunately the the the, the jazz bit of it was must have been okay because they let me in but um i did that on the electric bass but the condition was that i learned the double bass which i was fine with so somehow i got in there and um really just kind of shedded the double bass for 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 a long time just especially with the classical stuff as well, just like feeling like, like in at the deep end, you know, these other people who just been playing for years and were ridiculous. And, and then also just realizing I didn't know much about jazz either. You know, like playing chameleon is one thing, but like playing over changes, it's like a different thing as well. Yeah. So I kind of really immersed myself in that and just did lots of listening. Cause I realized 
was like, what? you know, they're giving me all this information. They're telling me like what notes I can play and what the chords mean and stuff. And I understand that, but it just doesn't sound right. And then it's like, okay, well, of course, because I don't really understand how it's supposed to sound. It's like learning French from like a textbook or something and then trying to speak French. It's never going to sound as, you know, it's not going to make sense as much as if you go and live in France and listen to people speaking French. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's like, so I was like, okay, I've got to understand how this music sounds. So I just really tried to immerse myself in that music as much as I could, you know, just trying to check out, go as deep as I could, like checking out the history of it, trying to understand it, you know, and I was in the right environment to do that. I was never going to be like committed enough to that music to to do it. It was incredibly helpful, you know, and I it, like I absolutely love playing in an orchestra. Like such a different experience from like playing in a small band or something, you know. Being part of that huge kind of sound and like being in a section with like five other double basses is like pretty incredible feeling, you know. But my heart was never in it like it was with you know playing non-classical music. I think I would have had to have really like committed to that path if I was going to do it. You have to be an incredibly high standard to do that. I don't know, I remember reading like Dave Holland saying about at some point, you know, he, he was considering going like he could have gone either way. I think he was probably his classical playing was probably a higher standard than mine. But he um, he had to decide which way to go. Well, for him anyway, he, he I think he decided he couldn't do both to the level that he wanted to do it. Some people can do it. Chris Lawrence, amazing classical and jazz double bass player. John Patitucci, I think, does classical stuff as well. I never have considered it as being like the route I wanted to go down. My heart wasn't in it, I don't think. Tom I met first because he was at school with us, you know. So he was kind of getting into jazz about the same time that I was. So I just used to go around to his house and we used to play with Dorian Ford. You know, you know Dorian? Yeah. yeah. And Dorian had been at Berkeley and had, I think had had like a hiatus from playing jazz for, for, for whatever reason. And I think he was just starting to get back into playing jazz again. And he was having classical lessons with Tom's mum. So he would come around and play with Tom and then they needed a bass player. So they asked me to come and Play. So Dorian would teach us like these tunes like St Thomas and you know how to play blues and stuff like that and Tom Skinner was just like I was like man he just really sounds proper you know sounds great you know and I'd heard him playing like Nirvana tunes and stuff like that but like it's like wow he really sounds like he knows what he's doing but so we would just play after that like you know he must have been like 13 or something at the time then I met Dave Akumu because we used to go to the weekend arts college. Did I whack? Yeah. So that was great. I met a lot of people there uh, and that was a really formative experience. And I, yeah, I just remember him turning up for the audition. I'd been there for a bit already and being like, whoa, this guy's great, you know. Um, and uh, then we became friends and, you know, he'd come and hang out at my house and yeah, we've been friends ever since. And then we started playing with Tom and then Tom and Andrew met at the Guildhall Summer School, I think the summer before I went to Guildhall to do my degree. So we started playing, so Andrew would have been about 16 or something. And by coincidence, he was going to sixth form at the same place that Dave was studying in Pimlico. So that crossed over there as well. So we, the four of us just used to get together at Tom's house every week for like, and just play for hours and hours, playing all these tunes that we didn't really know how to play, you know, like Wayne Shorter tunes and things, <laughs> things like that, with Dave and Andrew just shredding for hours. Like at college, you know, I learned a lot of stuff at college, but I didn't really learn how to play with people. Like I didn't play for like hours and hours with people. You might get someone soloing for like a chorus or two on like, you know, on a tune. But Dave and Andrew would just go on and on and on. And that's like, that's that feeling of like having to dig deep and like figure out, okay, so 
how do I keep this energy? You know, if someone's so <laughs> soloing, how do we keep going? Like, you know, how do we pace ourselves over like, you know, 12 minutes or something like that? You know, so you don't want to like, I don't, you know, you realize, well, you don't want to like go to the, the peak of the mountain like after three minutes, because then you've got to stay there somehow, or you've just got to fly into space somehow, you know. How do we keep this interesting? So like, it would just, it was like a kind of workshop for like figuring out like how to do stuff, you know, instinctively or just, you know, felt like we were all learning and we were all really hungry for it as well, you know. And we were really lucky to have like a, a place to, to play and, you know, parents who were encouraging as well and didn't tell us to shut up. I sort of started working before Guildhall because Dario and Adriano, his brother, would, the three of us would get gigs. Like we'd, we'd do these kind of background music gigs for like at the town hall or something for the council <laughs> when we're doing that or... So we, you know, we get paid like twenty five pounds or something. And it was like, wow. Um, so we'd started doing some gigs, and then when I was at WAC, we used to do gigs. We like the whole the whole of the class. We made this. We had this band called the Worms Turn, which was named after an Ian Carr tune. Ian Carr legend. <laughs> <laughs> and we used to go out and do gigs like with like three drummers and you know four guitar players and like whole load of saxophone players, two bass players. And we used to take it in turns, you know, or, so, or just all play at the same time. That was, like, that was brilliant. It's just that feeling of, like, no one's telling you you can't do anything. And now it would be taking a band of, like, sort of 15 people out to do a gig it might seem a bit kind of impractical. Or <laughs> I don't know, it's just that, you know, you don't really, it's like, okay, let's just do this. And we'd write music for it. And there was that feeling of like possibility that I think for me anyway, I think somehow like music school kind of like knocked a little bit of that out of me. There's an idea of you're supposed to do things in a certain way. And this is the way that you do this style. And then you have to learn this style. It's like a kind of progression you have to do, which, you know, is like, I'm not saying that's not important, but I think that there was, that that energy and that feeling of fearlessness when I was like 17 or something was just like, you know, and there's that, that feeling of, you know, someone's got like a copy of like the Weather Report record or something. It's like, oh, let me listen to that, you know, and, you know, just discovery, just like figuring out all this stuff like, oh, so like that guy, Herbie Hancock, who plays on the Headhunters record, he's playing with this guy, Miles Davis. And we played that tune, So What, in like, you know, in, in that class at school, you know. But this sounds a bit different from the way we played it. We played it with a backbeat, you know. Oh, right. I was expecting there to be some some slap bass on, on the <laughs> on Kind of Blue, you know. Because that's why I bought Kind of Blue. I mean, I've told this story a, few, a, a, a bit, but Mark Megiddo would like, when I first started having lessons with him, and he was like, why do you want to play the bass? And I was just like, I want to slap. And he kind of held his head in his hands. <laughs> it's just like, that. and he was like, "Okay, that's cool, but you know, there's more to playing the bass than that." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, whatever." <laughs> but he, you know, like he played me some like Miles Davis records with like Marcus Miller on it and Daryl Jones, and you know, and I was like, "Okay," and I went to like HMV, you know, determined to buy some like decoy or whatever, you know, with Daryl Jones and. So I got that and there was like a special offer on. So I think, I, so there was like kind of blue as well. So I was like, shit, maybe there's gonna be some good slap bass on, on this. <laughs> and I got it home and I put it in, in the cassette player. This is, there's no slap bass here, but this is, this is special, you know. But yeah, cause it had so what, I was like, I recognized it as well. And I was like, I'd go to like the, the record shop and I was like, Man, these jazz musicians, they're really stingy. You only get like three or four tunes on these albums. <laughs> it's like, you know, forget, I don't know, you get like a sort of pop record or whatever, there's like at least nine tunes on it. It's like four tunes, I'm not gonna buy that. It's not very good value for money. And then sort of realizing, oh, okay. So yeah, was it So What? A Cantaloupe Island, that was another one we played. And then it was in that advert as well, wasn't it? The KFC advert and it was a- uh, Like a Ronnie Jordan version of it. That, yeah, that was the so what. That was Ronnie Jordan did so what. It's like, yeah. 
but then yeah, discovered Miles. So leaving Guildhall, and then did you did you go straight into playing? Sorry, yeah. Um, one of the great things about being at Guildhall was that um, so not only was I on the I was on the undergrad course, so they had a postgraduate course. You know, it was a one year course, so I had four four years of being at the Guildhall, and every year there was like a new group of musicians on the postgraduate course, and it was quite a big course as well. There must have been like twenty or something people on that. So. That combined with people being on who are on the undergrad course as well, you know, it felt like this huge pool of musicians that I was getting to play with and meet. And there weren't that many bass players, so you know, I ended up getting to play with quite a lot of people. So I ended up doing quite a lot of gigs before I left college. And then when I left college, yeah, I just kind of carried on doing that for a while, just like playing, playing quite a lot of jazz really, which I, I love playing jazz, but I got to a point where I felt like um, I felt like I was doing bad impressions of like dead bass players you know and that's what people wanted me to do you know and I felt like there were other people who did it better or you know it was like this kind of it was like ah oh, you know this is it's kind of great and and, and all the musicians were, I was playing with were really good but like I think at a certain point I was like well I really like Prince I really like Radiohead and the Beatles and songs as well you know and Fortunately, I'd, I was still playing a lot with Dave and Tom, you know, so we were just like, well, you know, how do we, how do we reconcile, like, these different sides of our musicianship, you know, and it was like, I certainly felt like I needed to address, like, aspects of my musical interests that were not really being met, just playing kind of standard. And that was a totally personal thing, you know. Definitely I got to a point where I was like, well, I'm not really addressing all my kind of creative needs. And then, fortunately, playing playing with Tom and Dave and Andrew and actually the, the the Tomorrow's Warriors thing was really good for that as well. That was really creative, those jazz cafe jam sessions. But also like playing with Polar Bear, starting to play with Seb Rochford and Pete Wareham and Pete. I met on the um, post. He was on the, at the Guildhall on the postgrad. And then starting to play in Pete's band, Acoustic Ladyland. And then it felt like music that was us rather than trying to copy someone else's music. And that felt like those needs were being met a lot more. So that was a really important thing for me as well, just acknowledging like, what is it that I want to do? What do I need as a musician to feel good about like what I'm playing rather than fulfilling what I think someone else's expectations of what I should be doing are. Well, there was a, there was definitely a point where I realised that this the stuff that I really wanted to be doing, I was sort of having to fit around the other like the stuff that maybe I didn't want to do. And I mean, it's you know, it's, of course, it's a privileged position to be in. So like, you know, I was really grateful to to have people asking me to do their gigs and stuff. But it was like, okay, well, if I'm going to do the stuff that I really want to do, then I've got to kind of clear some space for that. So I actually stopped doing quite a lot of gigs, and I got a teaching job teaching guitar and bass, you know, to to make enough money but in order that I could do the things that I really, really wanted to do. So it was kind of, at some certain point, there was like, it was a creative choice to, to stop doing so many gigs and focus more on the, the playing with, playing the music that I wanted to create the space to do that with, you know? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it de depends what you define as success, but you know, it felt, I mean, especially like Polar Bear, you know, we were going for like 15 years, you know, and made six records, I think it was. You know, and it seemed to have, you know, it seemed to, yeah, it seemed to make an impact, you know. Um, the Invisible as well, you know, I mean, that's the, like Dave and Leo, two of my best friends as well. So it feels like, it feels like that, that The Invisible has been a bit more like we, we take quite a long time to make records. So, you know, we, we've never like really done like that much touring or like, loads and loads of gigging with that band that was such that's such an important space for for me to, to to play music and to those relationships and i guess it feels like those choices that i made paid off and i think one of the things that's that's been really really great as well is that actually through those bands because they have got a reputation of uh, some kind of reputation you know people who like that have asked me to do stuff for them, so that's kind of one of the ways that like I've got into doing sessions, you know, um, because that wasn't ever really my goal was to do session work, but 
you know, most of the sessions I've got have been through people wanting, who like the invisible or have like, like polar bear or something, or have like, you know, they, they, it's kind of come through those connections rather than going out, like looking for that work. I suppose I am now, yeah. Yeah. By accident. <laughs> but did you even know what that was before? When did when did you that first become a realization for, that you could make a career as a as a jobbing bass player? Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess I was always aware that you could make a career. You know that that I knew that there were people who did session work, but there was also there there was often that like, oh, you're either a session player or you're like a kind of creative player. You know, which is nonsense especially these days I mean I guess there were there was a time where like people would just be a studio musician because there was so much work doing that but I don't think it's like that anymore you know there aren't the budgets for like you know to have people in this you know that you can't you wouldn't have a wrecking crew on or you know doing like four or five sessions a day or something like that I guess for me like it's it's always happened quite organically there's always been like a kind of a connection with like a friend or something you know and a lot of you know like the, with, with Paul Epworth you know like we I first met him we did this we did this gig where we did this Miles Davis um, this was like years ago we put this band together like Tom and Dave um, we're doing like Miles electric stuff and we had like this huge band with like Andrew McCormack and Nick Ram on keys we had like Byron Wallen and Finn Peters and Jason Yard on the horns. We had like two percussionists, uh, Leo and Tom on drums. It was great, it was crazy. But we, yeah, we did all those Miles things and we had this gig in Manchester. And um, so this was like, I can't even remember when this would have been, but like Leo was like, oh, I've got a, I've got a friend who could do sound, I'll ask him. And then um, this guy, Paul, turned up, you know, got in the van with us and drove to Manchester to do this gig. And that was, yeah, that was Paul Edworth. You know, so those relationships have kind of grown over the years, you know, and then Leo was doing a lot of stuff with Paul. And then, you know, Paul would say, oh, if he, you know, can we get a bass player? So Leo would say, oh, what about Tom? You know, so then I ended up doing a, a few, some sessions with Paul and then, you know, and Dave's been doing that as well. So, you know, we've been really lucky that sometimes when he needs a rhythm section, he calls the invisible. So you're like a wrecking crew in that regard, aren't you? But... I suppose in some respects, yeah. Except that, yeah, we're not doing it every day. We're doing it like once a year or something. Like that. <laughs> but yeah, it's been really like Paul's been been really great. But I think you know a lot. It feels like a lot of that's a lot of the yeah a lot of the work that I've got has been just through relationships. You know, I suppose that's how it works, isn't it? Having played a lot of jazz, you know, where, where the idea is, is often, you know, there, there's, there's the, the, the idea of experimentation or like development or like embellishment or abstraction. And then when you're in, you're playing for someone's song, like, like every time, every time pretty much, by the third or fourth run through, everyone's playing much less than they did at the beginning, you know, and I think sometimes as a jazz player, like you, you often play with the idea that like other jazz musicians are watching you, and so you've got to kind of like show what you can do, which is not really how you make great music. But when you're in that, you know, like you can't play on a session and think, right, I've got to get all my best licks out. You know, I, it's like no, you're not playing. It's not about you. You're playing for the song. You're playing for the the artist. You're just there to to support that that vision. You know, and if it, if it is noodling, you know, then that's great. But most of the time, it's it's about, I don't know, my experience, excuse me, my experience is about playing more simply, you know, re, re, you know, uh, reduction rather than, you know, addition. Sometimes I'm told like, oh, it's this kind of track. Normally I'll, I'll try, sort of try and cover, pardon the pun, try, try and cover all the bases, you know. But so I'll take like something that sounds kind of more like old school. So like I've got like a couple of hollow body 
basses with flat wound strings. So I've got like a P bass with flat wounds on. So I'll take those and then I might take like a jazz bass or a P bass that's got like round wounds on for a more kind of modern, brighter sort of sound. And then I'll probably take some pedals with me just in case. But normally like normally that doesn't you know, they don't see the light of day, but <laughs> occasionally, occasionally, you know, like, oh, can, I, can I just try, can I just try this? Yeah, yeah, okay. And then they, they, they you know, they humour me. And occasionally it makes it onto the record. But um, actually, I've got to say, most of the time, I find that it's just like the P bass gets quite a lot of, the flat round P bass gets quite a lot of action. And like, people seem to like the hollow body Bases and actually the, the the brighter sound doesn't doesn't I don't I very very rarely get to use that actually mm. so it's sort of you know that's just my experience but sometimes there's that thing of people people have a uh, an association like they go oh I, I like you're playing on on that thing so it it doesn't happen that often that I get a session where someone's never heard me play before you know where they call call me out of the blue. In retrospect, some of those, the occasionally when that's happened, I've sort of gone, wow, I wasn't really prepared, <laughs> I wasn't really prepared for that one. You know, I wasn't really kind of, you know, turn up with like just a bass with flat wounds on it or something. And it's like, actually, this is really isn't what they're after. You know, <laughs> they want something more modern sounding. I'm a bass player. That's obvious, I suppose, because I play the bass, but like a bass player, bass player. I've never, I, I've never really felt like I could, I could do all the kind of flash stuff. Like I felt like technically, like I've never really, you know, I get really insecure sometimes watching Instagram videos where people are playing like, you know, ridiculous like stuff, you know, sort of seeing like mono neon and I'm just like, wow, that's like incredible, but I can't do that. The thing I think I was always drawn to playing the bass was always just like finding a really good baseline trying to find the part that really fits which is I think why some of my favorite players are people like I guess like you know everyone sort of says James Jameson or like Pino or Paul McCartney or someone like that the people that play that they play the note in the right place and it feels really good rather than kind of blinding us with science although having said that mono neon can do both you know but mm. I don't know this is a tricky question to answer really but I think I always like to play, I like to be supportive. I think that's my, my thing, you know, and be creative within that, but like trying not to lose sight of that, that, that role. I think part of it is having the freedom to do that, like because with those people, like with Dave, you know, with, with, the, with, with the, those projects that have been in Polar Bear, there's like a, an emphasis on, not an emphasis on experimentation because it's not about the experimentation, but it's about having the freedom to explore like our imaginations, you know. Those are situations where I've been able to try these things out and feel like there's a space to do that. Whereas like maybe more conventional situations, you know, they would never be a call for like, you know, a pitch shifting delay pedal, you know, or I don't know, some kind of, you know, it's like there's a, there, there's a context to explore those things in and a shared kind of uh, freedom f to do that in those contexts, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. I don't know, I mean, I sort of feel like I've sort of pieced it, pieced it together and like, like hoping that it's not going to fall apart. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, the first, the first thing was just that I love playing music. And when I thought about it, I didn't want to do anything else. You know, and then it was a case of like going to study music. And fortunately that didn't kill that desire for <laughs> to, 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 to keep playing music. Um, and then it's kind of happened. It hasn't, there's like, there's not been a plan. For me, the main thing has just been focusing on like, the money side of things, I, not that that isn't important, but for me, the most important thing has always been to focus on what is it that I want to do? Like, who do, what kind of musician do I want to be? What sort of people do I want to be playing with? What's important to me if I'm going to be doing this? 
so far that's kind of kept me afloat and I think if money was the priority I would have done something else like a long time ago but I've been really fortunate in a way I suppose that that, that I've, be, I've been able to to do what I've been able to do so I think like keeping in sight what it is that I want to be as a musician what feels true to me has always been really really important and that changes all the time then it's a case of like trying to figure out how to make ends meet as well so sometimes like playing really creative music doesn't necessarily pay the rent so there's like okay well maybe I need to like find a teaching job or something in as well you know it's a balance but when when the thing that's making the money like say teaching or whatever for me like uh, at this point if that starts becoming the focus then that's got to change you know or I, I kind of assess it and go okay well I'm going to do this for the next few years but actually you know keeping sight that sight of, of what is I really want to do so from that point of view I'd say that was really important for me anyway that's been really important just to focus on what I want as a player but then you know there's all the other stuff that's really going to help like being able to read again not essential but I'd say that like as a working player you know reading is really important um, in terms of like being reliable being approachable being like you know easy to get on with mm. those are all really important as well because no one wants an arsehole on the gig yeah those things are really important like having like like you we were talking about earlier on just like having your like learning stuff trying to learn it and turn up to the rehearsal or the gig having learned it that's going to make things easier for everyone they're going to go okay jack learn learn the parts on that we'll get him back because we, we know that we can rely on him all of those things are really important but in terms of like maintaining a career i think i've just been kind of improvising <laughs> along the way really i mean i suppose that's one of the things about cor the coronavirus is that it's like everyone's having to rethink like how they make a living which is i think is like really positive in some respects but it's kind of very frightening in others because mm. it's like like all my gigs have gone all the, all the you know until like at least March probably so it's like what do, how do you know how do how do I make a living from that but I think that's also healthy to like you know to to, to check in with yourself and reassess like okay well things have changed does that mean I have to like become a you know work for the post office or something or do I can I still make music and so how do I change that what is it I want to do can I do it in a different way you know I think those things can be really healthy you know because then you get out of your comfort zone you get into different areas but it's not easy rent as well is so expensive these days mm. it's a challenge but you have to love it basically you have to love what you're doing otherwise there's no point in doing it really yeah definitely that's been really important for me like just as creatively because I like as a bass player I think it, it, it can be easier to just sort of sit at the back and you know someone let someone else lead for me anyway I think I've been I've been like in a I've, I've played in other people's bands or like I've been it even in the invisible you know it's it's like a it's not just my responsibility so sometimes I let other people take the decisions sometimes but when it's just me then it's it's great like it's really challenging but I'm the only one that I decide how it goes. I decide who, who, you know, what what choices I make. You know, I can't rely on anyone else, which is is liberating, but it's also slightly uh, daunting sometimes. But it's been really good just to explore that, explore my own creativity. I've been doing some recordings during lockdown, and I've just been improvising. I set up my pedals and a mic and a double bass and plug it into my interface and then just improvise and see what comes out and try I've been just been really trying not to like judge it as well not not think it through too much just play and I'm at this I'm at the point now where I've done I've done like I've got quite a lot of material 
and I need to go and listen to it now, otherwise I'm just generating more material. But I've tried not to listen too much to it because I don't want to like start thinking, all right, I need to like tweak the sound on this bit or whatever. I just, it's like, because that, that's all of the stuff that gets in the way for me. It's just like, I get distracted or I get like, I get the critical kind of brain sort of switches on and I'm like, oh, that's terrible. Or like, that's a bit too messy. Or like, oh, I don't sound like, you know, Dave Holland or something like that. <laughs> So yeah, it's been great just playing. And actually, like, this, I'm really pleased with what's come, what I've got so far. So, so hopefully it will make it onto some kind of recording. But yeah, it's, it's been really good for me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tom. Once again, so good to see you again. And great to hear what you've been up to and what you have planned for the future. Please now, if you could all go and give us uh, both a follow on Instagram, it'd be much appreciated. Take care for now.